state must respect and protect it. And then in the third passage of that first provision it says all state authority must respect these human rights and they are directly applicable law, directly applicable to the executive judiciary and the, the legislature. Everyone is bound by this. That kind of is the framework, right? And of course I will, I will you know, uh, suggest that that's the right approach, that that's a game changer, right? But um, to, to take it one step further, that's beyond the question, but it only takes 20 seconds, uh, not, not only do you have a reference to, to, to the Constitution and the law, in the German Constitution there's also a reference to justice, the idea of justice, because law, although it binds public authorities, may not be just. <laughs> law may not be just. So, so <laughs> you, the executive is bound to law and justice says the Constitution. Law and justice. Now, what is this? How can law not be just? Well, just, you know, look, take a look in the history books and you will find Nazi law, right? And the recent, you know, uh, stash of pictures that was found in Munich, right? Uh, a lot of that, I understand, was, you know, based on legal transactions because the Nazi state made sure there were laws in place to deal with these questions. So law can be terribly unjust. That is why the Constitution of Germany says the executive is bound to law and justice. So th that, that transcends the state, that transcends the legislator, it transcends the Constitution because there's an idea of justice that lies beyond all of this. And it can be invoked by the Constitutional Court as a standard because law must need needs to be just. I mean, that's taking it a step too far maybe, but at least bind all state authority to the Constitution. That would be a good first step. Uh, I had three people who want to ask questions, but in the interest of the third uh, paper, the third speaker, I would now give the floor to him. Ekuro Albert, who not only uh, was involved in the drafting of the Constitution, but also in the enforcement of it. And I, I actually hope that he will speak also on the implementation and his role in the Commission uh, for Electoral and the Independent Electoral and uh, District Commission. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to try and be very brief, but I guess I just want to ask one big question. Can Egypt learn from the Kenyan constitution making process? Because, I mean, you've spoken about the product. Uh, Yoga has ably spoken about the product of the, of, of, of the Egyptian process, and did, so did uh, David. But I want to go to the fundamentals, so that the product we are speaking about ought to be, it is a product of some process. And therefore, that's the question I want to ask. And I know why I'm asking uh, this question, because as I was just asking um, uh, Gianluca, this is, I think, your sixth president since the revolution, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, fine. But that's the question I want to ask basically is that, you know, can you learn anything from our process? Because our process has been described as having been successful. And I think there are certain things that made our process in Kenya successful. And I just want to share with you my experience. And perhaps you can try and look at our experience as Kenya in, the, in your context. And then perhaps we can have questions. But I want to begin from a quote from Frank Spanon that said, each generation must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. I think the, the Egyptian society today can be looked at as that generation that want to discover its mission. Probably that was triggered the revolution. Uh, I know our constitutional right making process was triggered by the 2007-2008 post-election violence in Kenya. And somehow it gave us a reason to begin to rethink about our society. You also began rethinking the Egyptian uh, society from the time you decided, you know, you've had enough of these, you know, um, overstayers in political power. Uh, I'm sure the same thing could be said of Tunisia and, and, and other countries. Now, I want to begin by preliminary concerns when it comes to writing the constitution. If you are to define yourself as part of the greater civil society that, that wants change in society, I think there is then an agency within, within which 
you must identify a working formula that can complete the process of constitution making. And therefore, the question then is, whose constitution are we writing? Are we participating in the production of a constitution that we can identify with? It should be our constitution, our business, should not be about criticizing those who are writing the constitution, as the tendency mostly is with civil society groups, academics like yourselves, scholars, and everybody. I think it's time is about to get ourselves in there and say we want to participate in the writing of the constitution. And that, in a way, is one lesson that we try to do in Kenya. And therefore, you must be included in the process. I hear a lot of criticism about C50, C10, and that. But it's like we've, we become curious onlookers and bystanders in the process of making the constitution. Um, and therefore, for the youth, as I started by the press, I think the question we ask ourselves in Kenya is, we've been always told that you are tomorrow's leaders, but this tomorrow doesn't seem to come. <laughs> so we decided we must arrest this tomorrow and make this tomorrow today. And that today is in the process of making this constitution. Now, having said that, I want to share with you some background thoughts that went into our reform process. Because essentially, you're actually undergoing reform. People call it review, you can call it writing the concern, but it's essentially about reform. The first question, the first concern, I mean, background thought to us was, there has been a failure or there is a need to find a writing, a winning formula in completing the constitution-making process, or even institutional reform. Because we are not writing a constitution in the abstract. It's about the kind of institutions that we want, institutions that resonate with us. So therefore, we must find a formula on how to create those institutions within the constitution. And therefore, the risk, of course, with that, and this is, again, another background thought we thought ourselves in Kenya, there is every risk of reducing the concern into a shopping list of interests and needs. That everybody wants that which they passionately believe in to be written in the constitution. So the constitution can be a shopping list. You know, everybody comes on the table and says, I want this, I want this, I want it written in this way, you know, I want this provision crafted in this way. But what I want to remind you is that a constitution is a negotiated agreement. It's a negotiated instrument. It's a political instrument. So you must come on the, on the, on the, writing, on the writing table with, with issues that you want negotiated in. It shouldn't be, it's either my way or hit the highway. Because otherwise you may, not, you may end up with no constitution at all. Now, there is also the need to confront fear for change. I think a lot of people, and I, I saw this when, when we were in Tunisia, for example, and I've seen this in Zimbabwe, I've seen this in Malawi and Zambia, when I was asked to speak about them. There seems to be an inherent fear for change. People do, do not seem to know, okay, what if you made these proposals, how will society look like? I gathered from Tunisia is that the, process, the way the constitution was being written, it was as if it was written with Ben Ali in mind. There's almost the feeling that Ben Ali might just come back any time. I think there is an overbearing fear when we are writing the constitution, and that change. I think people need to free themselves from saying, and that's the kind of paradigm shift that Yogo was talking about, looking at the 1971 constitution, 2012. 2013. Is there really a shift? Is there really change? So we must exercise that demon of fear when you are writing the constitution. But for us in Kenya, the biggest question was this, and we, you know, let's be frank here, we must be brutally frank, that there are many elephants in the room, but I think the biggest of them all was the executive. And the question was, how do you tame the executive in a constitution making process? And probably that's why in Kenya, I, I could, it could be the only constitution again in the world, I stand to be corrected, <laughs> that has a whole chapter on what's called leadership and integrity. We actually prescribe the character and type of leader we want in Kenya. Because we said, you know what? Since the era of the colony, one of the frailties of our society has been the failure of leadership to take us to where we want, 
talk of institution, talk of human rights. You can prescribe them, you can write the most beautiful document in the world called the Constitution, but you put in a dog in, in, the, in it, I mean, with the function there, in, it won't matter. The dog might probably just end up barking and not leaving the letter and the spirit of the Constitution. So really it's about institutional, but also it's about the people who are given the greater responsibility within a constitutional context. So we said in Kenya, we, will, we must tame the executive. But I hope we have time, I'll try to demonstrate to you how we brought in provisions in our constitution, which I would like you to compare with yours and see whether, actually, have we tamed the executive? Because even looking at the context of the fact that you've had six presidents, I think, ever since, I, that was my last count, I think, I, I don't even know the name of the current president, but I, I know the last one was Mursi, yeah? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, I make the point. But, but how should the process be like? I think Egyptians, just like Kenyans, you have a constitutional moment mm -hmm. and probably opportunity to write the constitution. What's going on right now in your country is that moment that you need. I think you need to grab it. In the context of Kenya, we talked about the post-election violence. There was fatigue about the new constitution. There was a lot of dialogue about it. So it is that moment, in my view, that I think you have, the, you, you have and you must grab it. Now, again, having said that, you cannot really reinvent the wheel. If you're talking about checks and balances, democratic principles, human rights, you know, I'm not saying you cut and paste what has happened in Kenya, in Germany, in South Africa, and other jurisdictions. But I think you also now need to ask yourself, do we need to prolong this discourse on what are the obvious principles of constitutionalism? And in Kenya, we were bold enough to say, you know what, South Africa, you wrote a constitution. You know, Uganda and the rest. Let's discuss how you crafted these provisions in the constitution. Um, and therefore, the idea was find a formula that does not necessarily compromise the process, but balances interests and negotiates people's feelings into the constitution. Now, the other question that we asked ourselves in Kenya was, can everyone really write a constitution? Given an opportunity, can everyone write a constitution? Or can anyone reform an institution? So there, therefore, there seems to be a fiduciary duty on those who are given the opportunity to write a constitution to think about society, to think about the vulnerable, the marginalized, you know, the minority groups. So that, if, you know, if you went to my village back in Turkana, my native land where I came from, and went to my grandmother who has never been to anybody's classroom, formal uh, classroom, and asked her, you know, write a constitution, she wouldn't know what you're talking about, even if you translated it in our mother tongue. I'm sure the same situation exists in, in Egypt. And therefore, there ought to be some sort of responsibility over others, over society. Uh, therefore, a different type of dialogue must be hatched. Now, we went into institutional reform because we felt some of the problems in our society was about the institution that serves us as a people, including the constitution itself as an institution, the executive as an institution, Parliament as an institution, the judiciary as an institution. And we asked, what's wrong with our institution? And we took a diagnostic approach to our institution. So as we re review the 1971, 2012, 2013, have you done a diagnostic analysis of this institution and said, this is the malady within the executive. This is the malady within the, the legislature. And I think as an academic institution, you really must do that and offer your views to the committee. You know, but again, that depends on the, on the kind of design you, I mean, you talk about. But also, what's wrong with our society? You see, institutions mirror the failings in society. Think about corruption, impunity, norms, value system of a certain character. It's a mirror. So when an institution is failing, I think it's foolhardy to keep on lambasting that institution because it's an abstract reality. You must question the people given the responsibility within those institutions why they are not delivering on human rights principles, for example. But we also need to be specific. Now, the first thing that we 
which started off as Kenyans, besides what I've just told you, was the framework. How are we going to write this constitution? And we thought about two issues in terms of the framework, actually three. There is the legal framework itself, and we anchored our process within the constitution. Even the current constitution that you have, it must anchor this process of completing this constitution. We therefore had to amend our constitution, certain provisions, so that we protect the process of constitution making. I'm not sure that is the situation in Egypt. So the constitution must be very clear. How are we going to complete the process? Then we had the Constitution of Kenya Review Act, which created various organs on how they are going to complete the process. Then, of course, there is the political framework itself. You know, talking about politics within and outside the law, we, had, we wrote a national accord after the post-election violence. And that national accord somehow brought all the political voices together. I'm sure maybe this is too late in the day for, for, for Egyptian because, you know, you are, you are in a hurry to pass the constitution next, uh, you know, I think next month for the referendum. I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing, but, you know, uh, I'll tell you anyway uh, what kind of process we went through. Um, so therefore, uh, so we, we took a reality check as a country. I mean, you know, as I was walking here and walking through Tahrir and saying, wow, I'm actually almost on holy grounds. This is where the revolution started. So we took a reality check. I'm not sure the assembling at Tahrir Square is in itself a reality, a reality check on the, on, the, on the Egyptian society. You probably need to go beyond that. And what are the real terms of references for now writing the constitution in, in, in Egypt? So that's one major point, the framework. And if I have time, I'll take you through the review, the review Act of 2008 and the timelines therein in writing the constitution. So I'll, I'll skip that. And then there was a whole process related to the committee of experts. Uh, but I think what is most important for me is to say, what were the organs of the review? I keep on asking myself this question. How is the C50, how was the C50 appointed? How was the C10 appointed? How representative are they? Let me share with you an example of how our context was. In, in the Constitution of Kenya Review Act of 2008, there were four main organs of the review. There was the Committee of Experts, where I was you know, um, very much involved in. We were basically the drivers and we could reject any proposal from the political class, especially if we thought it was unreasonable. But we also wanted to be protected as a committee. Our independence was assured as a committee of experts. And that was anchored in the law and the constitution, as I said, in a framework. Then there was the Parliamentary Select Committee of Parliament. We will write the constitution or draft, we'll send it to them, then they have a time frame within which to look at it so that they don't just politic with it. Send us back with their comments. And the constitution required that you must have written reason, rationale why you made certain proposals. Now, I've not seen anything like that in the, in the Egyptian process. Proposals are made, but it's not accompanied by any report. Basic. So that people are able to understand, this is how you reached this provision. This is how you reached this you know, chapter. This is the rationale. In Kenya, that was very key. If you don't give reasons, I'm sorry. For example, our politicians described the Senate as a lower house. And we told them, Why, wait a minute, where on earth have you ever had Senate described as a lower house? And we told them, ask, give us justification. So we rejected as the committee of experts. Then of course we had the National Assembly and finally the referendum. What I wanted to say in the referendum is, and I'm sure you're going to go to that, is referendum does not necessarily have to be decisive, de divisive rather. It could be a process to legitimate a document, but that legitimation has to be supported by a process where everybody is happy that this is a product of a process. So that the referendum does not have to be very divisive. So, if you have to look at a roadmap to restoring institution or a new constitution, it comes with a lot of challenges. There's a long history of elusive institutional reform. There's a lot of misunderstanding. There's the ignorance and sometimes mediocrity on those who are actually given the opportunity to make the constitution. There's also selfishness and individualism. And I think that's something that we need to watch very carefully. Now, I think one of the things reading your process, 